This presentation is on the development of the GI system in which we'll talk about the formation of the gut tube from the esophagus all the way down to the anal canal. After this lecture you should be able to define the segments of the gut tube. You should talk about the different subdivisions and what adult structures arise from each subdivision. We want you to especially understand the rotation of the gut and know what are the consequences of abnormal uh, rotation. We'll also talk about the cells in the gut tube, in particular the neural, muscular, connective tissue, and endocrine cells in the gut, and also talk about some of the other developmental defects that are associated with abnormal development. Again, we can go back to this trilaminar embryo. We can find the oral plate. We can find the cloacal plate. And we can see the gut tube. And what we can do then is follow lateral body folding. And with lateral body folding, what we're going to end up with is a gut tube suspended by a mesentery. So here we're looking at the endoderm and at this point the yolk sac and with lateral body folding which we'll we will review again what you'll see is the formation of the body cavity between the two layers of lateral plate mesoderm as that body cavity increases in size we'll see the lateral folding of the embryo which will continue until we get a gut tube surrounded by splanchnic mesoderm and sitting within the body cavity. If we look at a sagittal section, again, the oral plate, cloacal plate, we can talk about the development of the gut looking at head and tail folding. Again, the oral plate, cloacal plate, the yolk sac and with the rapid expansion of the head we get this cul-de-sac forming behind the oral plate and that will be called the foregut. In addition with the tail folding we get a cul-de-sac forming here that is the hindgut and there will be a little diverticulum that develops and connects to that hindgut called the allantois which you see right there. So that after head and tail folding and lateral body folding, we have a gut tube. We have the oral plate, the foregut, the midgut, a hindgut, which once it receives the allantois, we can call it the cloaca, this expanded area down here by the cloacal plate. Just another view, again showing us the gut tube in the embryo. If we look just at the gut tube, we can now identify the foregut in yellow, the midgut in both green and blue, and there's two parts of the midgut, a cephalic and a caudal part, and then in purple we have the hindgut, the expanding cloaca, and the allantois. Once again, we see the gut tube, and we need to talk about what happens to each of the segments of the gut tube. We will start with the foregut. One final word about the distal end of the gut tube, and that is once again making the point here that as the allantois empties into the hindgut, we form this enlargement called the cloaca. So what happens is we have a little bit of the allantois sticking out with uh, a little bit of the vitellin stalk in the region of the connecting stalk. And this is about five weeks of development, the end of the fifth week of development, 35 days. So you can see the umbilical cord. 
Now, when we talk about the primitive gut, as we said, there's a stomodium, that's the oral cavity, which is lined by ectoderm at the cranial end. Then we have the foregut with endodermis splanchnic mesoderm, a midgut with endoderm again and splanchnic mesoderm. The hindgut as well has the epithelium derived from endoderm and the connective tissue and muscle divide, uh, comes from splanchnic mesoderm. And then we can talk about the proctodium, the distal end, also called the anal pit, and we'll see the transition from endoderm to ectoderm at the caudal end of the GI tract. Now one of the things that we can ask ourselves is what allows for the formation of this gut tube? What happens that allows these endoderm cells to be maintained and develop into a tube? And one of the things that's important is sonic hedgehog, which you've heard a lot about in embryology. And a sonic hedgehog is secreted from the endoderm and it's important in gut tube development. In addition, the Hox genes influence development in a cephalocaudal pattern. Again, the Hox genes are segmental genes and we see that they can influence the different regions of the gut tube to develop. When we talk about the foregut and its derivatives, we're talking about everything from the pharynx, that includes the tonsils, the back of the tongue, salivary glands, through the lower respiratory system, which we've already talked about, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum, the first and part of the second parts of the duodenum, everything up to the bile duct. Included in foregut derivatives are the liver, the biliary system, and the pancreas. So, here you can see the foregut developing, and this is just a review of there's a gut tube in yellow. We have the respiratory diverticulum, the tracheoesophageal fistula forming, and this is important, important in the development of the foregut. Remember, we want to make sure that there are no communications between the respiratory diverticulum and the foregut, the future esophagus. As we move downward towards the region of the foregut that will become the stomach, we can see that this region dilates and it dilates along its posterior surface. Initially, you can see the mesentery attaching to the gut tube and this is the ventral mesentery and again, you notice the dilation of the posterior region of the gut. Next, over two weeks, we're going to see not only a continuation of that enlargement of that posterior region of the gut tube, but also a rotation of the gut, such that the ventral surface is going to move over to the right, the dorsal surface is going to move over to the left, the ventral mesentery is going to move to the right, and the dorsal mesentery is going to move to the left. And so, as that rotation continues, what you're going to see is the stomach then with this enlarged area moving over to the left side. The dorsal border then is moving left and dragging the dorsal mesentery with it. This means that a bursa will form back here and that is the omental bursa. In addition, the ventral mesentery will move over to the right. As the stomach grows, this region that was the posterior region continues to grow and enlarge, move over to the left, and eventually this cranial region is going to move inferiorly. The caudal region is going to move superiorly, that is the region that will become the pyloric stomach, and it will move to the right. And in doing so, the long axis of the stomach now becomes nearly transverse. Along with the rotation of the stomach, the vagus and the two vagal trunks, 
the anterior vagal trunk and posterior vagal trunk are going to form from the left vagus and the right vagus respectively. So as the stomach rotates, we find that the vagus uh, is then going to rotate as well and the left vagus nerve on the ventral surface of the stomach uh, comes to lie in the ventral surface and we'll call that the anterior vagal trunk. Whereas the right vagus nerve comes to lie in the posterior part of the stomach and becomes the posterior vagal trunk. Finally, we can talk about the blood supply and recognize that the foregut receives its blood supply from branches of the celiac artery. The celiac trunk then gives rise to the arterial supply of all gut tube structures, foregut structures, including the stomach. The duodenum then is also derived from the foregut up to the region where the bile duct enters into the second part of the duodenum. The rest of the duodenum from the second th through the fourth part uh, is derived from midgut. Now when we look at the growth of the duodenum we remember the stomach was rotating over to the left the pyloric region of the stomach was moving to the right and cephalically and so it throws the duodenum over to the right side and the duodenal loop forms then and it comes to lie not in the midline but now over on the right paravertebral gutter. Again this is all a result of the rotation of the stomach and as the stomach rotates so does the duodenum. And that the one loop ends up rotating to the right. And along with it, we see the pancreatic buds and the bile duct also rotating to the right. Eventually, the duodenum, as it rotates over to the right, comes to lie upon the posterior body wall. As it does so, the mesentery behind the duodenum gets reabsorbed and so the duodenal loop then is said to be secondarily retroperitonealized. Another important element to think about, especially in the region of the duodenum, but actually throughout the whole gut tube, is that during the fifth and sixth weeks the epithelial components derived from the endoderm begin to proliferate rapidly. And as they do so, they tend to uh, fill up the lumen, especially in the region of the duodenum, so that that lumen can become plugged by epithelial cells. Now normally, it later becomes recanalized and open so that we can end up with a patent uh, open gut tube. In addition, Coming off the foregut is the liver butt. The liver butt is going to be a diverticulum of endothelial cells, excuse me, yeah, and endoderm cells. And these endoderm cells are going to migrate up into the region of a transverse septum up here called septum transversum. And these cells are going to move up and mingle with cells of septum transversum and also with some of the blood vessels in the posterior body wall. So that when we look at the development of the liver, the endoderm is going to form the actual liver parenchyma, the, hep the hepatic cells, the liver cells themselves, whereas the vitellin veins are going to give rise to the sinusoids, and then the connective tissue cells are going to come from some of the mesoderm of septum transversum. Finally, the liver cupfer cells, which are macrophages, are going to be derived from monocytes that migrate in to this developing liver. Early on, the liver is involved in hemopoiesis and so the liver is rather large relative to the body cavity and actually the somatopoietic function is going to decrease over the fetal life 
and by the last two months of gestation it really diminishes and moves towards the bone marrow uh, for the actual uh, hematopoietic cells that we find in the adult. As the liver develops, we're going to see that diverticulum is going to narrow down and form the bile gut. And we're also going to see another diverticulum that arises, and that diverticulum is going to become the cystic duct and the gallbladder. So that what you're going to have then is the formation of the liver, the cystic duct, the gallbladder, and the bile duct which is going to empty the bile from the gallbladder and the liver into the second part of the duodenum. Now we want to recognize that just like the duodenum, the bile duct epithelium can form an epithelial plug which then has to open again. Uh, at times this may not happen and you can get problems with bile function. Finally we're going to look at the pancreas pancreas actually originates as two pancreatic buds here seen in pink uh, and what we see here is the stomach in yellow and we see the duodenum in white we see the bile duct the cystic duct the gallbladders in green and on either side of the region where the hepatic bud developed there are two pancreatic buds which you can see here now, as you remember, the stomach rotated to the left, the bile, uh, excuse me, the duodenum rotated to the right, and with that rotation, the two pancreatic buds are going to rotate, and they're going to come together and form the pancreas. So there's a dorsal pancreatic bud in the dorsal mesentery, and a ventral pancreatic bud in the ventral mesentery near the bile duct. And what's going to happen is as this duodenum moves over to the right, we're going to see this dorsal, uh, the pancreatic, ventral pancreatic bud move dorsally and come to lie uh, a little posterior and caudal to the dorsal bud, which we see here. That's what we're trying to depict in this series of images. So the ventral bud is going to form the uncinate process and the inferior pancreatic head while the dorsal bud, which you see here, is going to make up the rest of the gland. And the main pancreatic duct is formed by a fusion of the dorsal and ventral pancreatic ducts. And sometimes this duct here will remain as an accessory pancreatic duct. This just series of cartoons makes the same point. Here we see the main pancreatic duct forming and here we can see the pancreas then forming. When we talk about the pancreas we can think about well, what factors influence this endoderm to become pancreatic tissue. We have to talk about fibroblast growth factor and activin and these are secreted by the notochord Remember the notochord is going to be just uh, posterior to the foregut. And what they're going to do is repress sonic hedgehog in the endoderm here. And that's going to help signal the, the endoderm cells to become pancreas. Now there is a pancreatic and duodenal homeobox gene and that gets upregulated during pancreatic development. And we also have to think about the islets of Langerhan because if we look at the pancreas, there is a exocrine pancreas and there's an endocrine pancreas. And so the question is, with the endocrine pancreas, how do those cells differentiate? And we do know that the PAX4 and PAX6 genes help specify the beta cells, which are going to make insulin, and the other endocrine cells of the pancreas. Insulin secretion itself begins at five months. So insulin begins to be secreted at this point, so we know these pancreatic cells have differentiated, and it's a much more complicated story, 
but certainly PAX4 and PAX6 are genes that are upregulated that allow for the differentiation of these specific cell types. The spleen is going to develop in the dorsal mesentery, which is what we're trying to depict here. And in yellow, we're trying to depict the spleen, which develops at about the fifth week of gestation. And when we look at the mid-gut, we're going to talk about gut uh, formation in terms of the rotation of the gut, another set of rotatory movements. And these will be very different than what we saw with the stomach. Because during the development, early development, what's going to happen is that liver is going to get rather large and two kidneys, the mesonephric kidneys, are going to get really large. And as they enlarge, they crowd out that abdominal cavity. And so the midgut is going to herniate out into the connecting stalk. So there's going to be a herniation of the gut tube out the connecting stalk, both the gut tube and its mesentery. This midgut is going to form what's called the primary intestinal loop. It's going to maintain a connection with the yolk sac, and that connection is going to be called a vitellin duct. If this persists, this duct of Meckel's diverticulum can form, or a vitellin fistula uh, can form, or a vitellin cyst, depending on how much of this duct persists. So there's lots of variations here. And about 1 or 2 percent of the population, all uh, individuals have Meckel's diverticuli, which are not dangerous or life-threatening. Now let's turn back to the midgut and we can see in green the cephalic limb and in blue the caudal limb. We can see that they're forming this primary intestinal loop which is beginning to herniate out. Here we can see at six weeks we have the herniation as the midgut migrates into the umbilical cord. And one of the things that's going to happen at this point is that we're going to get the rotation of the gut 90 degrees. So you can see here that the cephalic limb and the caudal limb are going to begin rotating. The caudal limb is going to move up and the cephalic limb is going to move caudally. When the gut tube returns then at 10 to 12 weeks, what we're going to have is continued rotation of the gut, another 180 degrees. Now the reason that the gut tube can re-enter in the abdominal cavity is that there's more room. The mesonephric kidneys have degenerated for the most part and the liver has reduced in size compared to the abdominal cavity. So here you can see the continued rotation of the gut tube until now the caudal limb lies cephalically and in front of the cephalic limb. The first part of the gut tube to return is the jejunum and it returns on the left side. And as the other segments of the midgut return, that is the ilium, then the cecum, then the ascending colon, uh, they're all going to move towards the right side. And the cecum is the last part to return it returns to the right side under the liver. And the cecum is going to form then the ascending colon and the hepatic flexure. The last part of the midgut is going to form the transverse colon or at least two-thirds of it. So the midgut rotates 90 degrees during the herniation and 180 degrees to when it returns in here it is, six weeks. Week eight, 90 degrees rotation. At week 10, probably 180 or more. And then by week 11, it is rotated all the way. We have in green the jejunum, much of the ilium, and then the remainder of the ilium, the cecum with the appendix, and a little bit of ascending colon, hepatic flexure, all the way down to the last part of the transverse colon. 
you notice how this a semicolon and the transverse colon are going to enlarge but now you can see how the transverse colon comes to lie in front of the jejunum which is in green one of the things that we can talk about is the endoderm cells and this has an interesting uh, set of concepts to talk about and that is to say we have goblet cells and pterocytes and enteroendocrine cells that exist in the intestinal glands and you can see how they're organized here in that the goblet cells enterocytes and enteroendocrine cells are in the upper part of the gland Panis cells are in the lower part of the gland stem cells are in between so these stem cells can de can develop into panis cells or any of the other cell types and the question is how do they know what to become this is where the went signaling pathway becomes important and in addition to that we can see some of the factors important in stem cell differentiation because what you have here are all the different cell types the cells that make secretin cholecystokinin GPL GIP serotonin substance P somatostatin and gastrin all these cells then lie in the epithelium and are derived from endoderm. They're all derived from these stem cells. And so the stem cells are also going to give rise to the enterocytes, the absorptive cells of the gut. So the stem cells, whoops, let me back up here. The stem cells are going to, under the influence of MATH1, form two populations of cells, both enterocytes and secretory cells. Then, under NGN3, the secretory cells are going to begin to differentiate into either panis cells or goblet cells or the endocrine cells. And then we know that some of the factors that are important for the differentiation of these cells are beta 2 and, if you notice, PAX4 and PAX6, so we're talking about the PAX genes again in terms of endocrine function. One of the things that we also need to talk about is the NOTCH gene, and what NOTCH does, it inhibits endocrine differentiation, and this does so in a couple different ways. One of the important ways it does so is NOTCH gets expressed in cells that begin to differentiate and inhibit adjacent intestinal cells from differentiating into the same cell type. So you don't get all cells making serotonin or all cells getting making somatostatin. So NOTCH can work at a higher level keeping these stem cells proliferating and then at a local level it can act to actually make sure that adjacent cells form different endocrine type cells. In addition, what we need to think about is the gut tube and its neural innervation. You remember that we have neural plexus forms forming along the gut tube and it will regulate smooth muscle and so we're going to have the myenteric and submucosal plexi forming and we know that the vagal neural crest cells, that is cells developing up here in the region of the medulla, are going to innervate the gut tube. That is, they're going to migrate down and populate these different regions where we're going to have these ganglia form. In addition, there's a small population of lumbosacral neural crest cells that innervate the hindgut and migrate upwards. And they'll innervate the hindgut. There is a question as to how much overlap there is and whether the vagal neural crest cells can do the whole hindgut or not. But these are the two populations of neural crest cells that form the ganglia along the gut tube. And we can look at how these ganglia form in that we have proliferating neural crest cells and we have mesenchymal cells. And one of the things that can happen is that under sonic hedgehog, 
they keep the neural crest cells proliferating, but they allow the mesenchymal cells to differentiate into muscle. So the sonic hedgehog takes mesenchyme and helps it differentiate into muscle cells. As I said, it keeps the neural crest cells proliferating. So for the neural crest cells to leave their proliferating state and migrate and then differentiate, they are then under the influence of glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor. Once this is available, uh, this factor then uh, prompts the neural crest cells to stop proliferating, to begin migrating, and then eventually they will differentiate into the cells of these different ganglia. Hirschsprung's disease then, or congenital me megacolon, arises as the neural crest cells uh, don't develop in a segment of the large intestine. Without neural crest cells in the ganglia forming, this is, there is a constriction in that region of the bowel and so the region proximal to that constriction is going to dilate. So there's proximal distension and constriction that can actually cause the uh, bowel not to allow the uh, movement of feces through it. Uh, congenital me megacolon is more often found in males than females. I think it's a four to one ratio. Uh, it's often, a, it can be associated uh, gen with genetics and there's some indication of where that, which genes are affected that can tr be traced to this 10 per, uh, to 15 percent of the uh, family associated uh, congenital megacolon. In addition, about uh, 10 to 15 percent of those uh, that have Hirschsprung's disease have Down syndrome. So there seems to be some connection there. When we talk about the hindgut, we talked about the fact that the terminal portion it comes in contact with the ectoderm and forms the cloacal plate or cloacal membrane. Uh, the membrane is endoderm of the hindgut on the inside and ectoderm of the anal pit on the outside. The cloaca is the extended part of the hindgut which receives the elantois. So as we look here, we can see this enlarged cloacal area. And what's going to happen is this cloaca is going to enlarge. There's the cloacal plate. And as it does so, and it enlarges, it's going to form two different structures. And it's going to be separated by a septum the urorectal septum. The two structures that are going to form are the UG sinus ventrally and the rectum and anal canal dorsally. So by seven weeks what you're going to end up having is the urogenital sinus ending as a urorectal septum excuse me, as a urogenital membrane and the rectum and then anal canal ending as the anal membrane. The separation right here is with the urorectal septum. When we think about this formation then of the cloaca and its differentiation, what we're going to think about is the fact that Here's another region where we have epithelial mesenchymal interactions. Again, sonic hedgehog is important. Fibroblast growth factor, in this case fibroblast growth factor 10 is also important. And one of the things that happens is that bone morphogenetic protein is important in signaling to the mesoderm. One of the reasons we bring up these three genes is that if there are problems with it, these genes and their expression, what can end up happening is anal rectal malformations can form. One of those types of malformations is a complete lack of the separation of the UG sinus, so there's just a common UG sinus, 
and the rectum would end up emptying into the same region as the ureters into the bladder. In addition, what you can get are the septum forming but not perfectly and you can get fistulas that can occur between the UG sinus and the rectum.